There are only nine days remaining now for those who want to get in on the action with my £2 for a brand new PS5 competition. Many of you already know about it and many of you have already entered. For those who haven't entered and who are maybe sceptical about the chances of winning, because this raffle is so much smaller than most others on the market, it means that everyone who does enter technically has a much better chance of winning. On the other hand, I may well end up delivering it in person <laughs> with the way things are currently with delivery costs worldwide, so depending on the country I may end up doing a road trip to give the winner their PS5, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. For those who want to enter, of course, the link is right below in the description. Well folks, it's here. The December, aka Christmas update for Gran Turismo 7 is out. We have no new circuits, but we do have five new cars, and those are, of course, the Alfa Giulia GTAM, the Bugatti Chiron, the Ferrari Vision GT, the Toyota Celica Rally Car, and last, but definitely not least, in fact, probably the first one in terms of importance based on the comments I've seen for many people, the C8 Corvette. So, I'm going to get my in-depth thoughts for all five of the cars in their own reviews in the coming days on the channel, and I will be reviewing the C8 Corvette first, but for now I'll be giving my brief thoughts on my first impressions of each of the cars, some of the tuning that can be done, and also a couple of the other things, of course, that have dropped or changed in the update. Now, we do have some new events. We tend to get one or two, you know, new collection books or whatever in the cafe menu. Many of us probably own a lot of the cars in question, although this time there is a Bugatti collection, which which I would imagine more than a few players probably don't have all of those, especially the Veyron, but if you do, then of course you'll get that pretty easily. There are some new events. I know a lot of players were hoping for more Monza races. We've only had one up until now, as crazy as that sounds. There is now a new event at Monza. There's a new event on the Nürburgring as well, a new event at Bathurst. So a little selection, nothing too crazy, and for those wondering, none of them appear to be particularly high in terms of being cash cows, and some of those events you'll actually see see me driving the cars here in, just to get a handle of how they are. We do have some more escapes locations as well, in particular a Norway collection with around 40 of them. I know a lot of people don't care, but it is there and some of them are quite pretty. We also have, of course, the Ferrari in the form of a winning ticket for those who answered the question correctly in the 25th anniversary week. So, of course, many of us will already have that. If you don't already have it, it will be releasing in the game on the 23rd the day before, incidentally, my PS5 competition ends, so that'll probably have a price of a million credits, I would imagine, based on the existing Vision GTs. And speaking of prices, how much are these five cars going to cost you? Well, all in all, just under 4.6 million credits. So for five cars, that sounds pretty hefty, but you do have to bear in mind about a million of that is for the Ferrari, three million credits of that is the Bugatti, which I have a sneaking suspicion quite a few players probably won't even bother buying. And without that, the other three are actually quite affordable. The Alfa Romeo is more than I would have guessed at 220,000, but still not breaking the bank. The Celica is 250,000. It is available already in the legendary dealer, which is nice. I don't particularly like having to wait until the next day for no real reason to buy that, so we can already buy it. Incidentally, hasn't really changed in price that much from when it was last in, in Gran Turismo 6, if I recall correctly. I want to say it was like 300,000, I think, something like that. And, of course, the car which most people want the most is, in a great twist, but not a surprising one, the cheapest. 85 grand for the new Corvette is pretty damn great. So now, without any further ado, let's get into my brief thoughts of said cars. Kicking off first of all with the Corvette, simply put, it is great. It is every bit as good as you would think a mid-engine Corvette could be. With a front engine, they're already fantastic cars. The C6 is an absolute monster from the ZR1 to the base model. The C7 is a very good car as well, even in its Stingray form, let alone Z06s and ZR1s. This one is great. I will say it's a little bit Nissan GTR-ish in terms of being forgiving. Some people might find it too forgiving, perhaps. But, I mean, that's not a bad problem to have if you are planning on using it as a racer. It has tons of tunability, some very nice visual upgrades, including a wide body. And even though it doesn't have the wing as standard, you can fit the factory-looking wing to solve that and change it. And it looks to be a very, very useful tool. For those who were looking forward to the car, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. Next up, the Bugatti Chiron. This is the one that I was looking forward to the most. I'm a huge fan of the Veyron. It's one of my real-world dream cars. The Chiron is a car which I wasn't a huge fan of, but it's definitely grown on me. Boy, is it different to the Veyron, which is good to know. You wouldn't want it to just feel like the same thing, and from what I understand, that is accurate to real life. 
In real life, the Chiron is a bit more savage than the Veyron, and of course quicker. In the game, it is most definitely quicker. You can tune this Chiron to 1800 brake horsepower. So, ridiculous territory. It's one of the most powerful cars in the game. And for those who are maybe curious, of course, yes, it is a 300 mile per hour car when fully tuned. You can drop the weight a lot, even doing a stage 4 weight reduction straight from the tuning shop. So yeah, it's one hell of a machine. I will say though, it's not as forgiving as the Veyron. It's quite a lot twitchier when fully tuned. Of course, the brakes are a little on the weak side before tuning, but again, it's a two-ton car. It's somewhat like piloting a Meteor with a steering wheel, so you've got to expect it to feel like that. And again, the Veyron, the Chiron, these are cars which feel so much better in real life than they do in a game, because the reason why they're so good just doesn't translate to a game. You know, the Veyron wasn't built to win races, and neither was the Chiron. It was built to be essentially a 250 mile an hour Bentley, and for that it's great. But that doesn't really translate to a racing game that well, where something like a Koenigsegg or a McLaren, which is designed more for track use, especially the McLaren, well, of course they're going to feel better on a track. It's what they're designed for. Next up, we have the Celica. The Celica is a very interesting one in terms of tuning, that's for sure, because although it's in Group B, a severely underpowered Group B car with just under 300 horsepower, and it does struggle. You'll see me going up against the Group B car in the Fisherman's Ranch event, and it does struggle on the straights especially. It also looks comically small next to the Toyota 86, but in a crazy twist, you give this thing a turbo upgrade, you immediately jump from 300 horsepower to just under 800, which is absolutely bonkers. You can also, in a pretty cool uh, little addition, much like the Stratos in GT6, put rally spotlights on the front, which is pretty cool as well. I have no doubt this is going to be a hugely popular car as a livery base as well, a canvas to draw on, and it's a pretty legendary car, and for good reason. Next up we have the Alpha. The Alfa Romeo is a car which I so badly want to do an episode of Game vs. Real on, like I did last month with the M2 competition. Unfortunately though, I just don't think I can justify doing it, because the one that I drove in real life in beards and cars was not the M. It was a GTA, and I just don't feel like it would be appropriate for me to compare the GTA to the GTA M. And the reason why I want to so badly is because the GTA might be the best handling car I've ever driven in real life. So quite a high bar. My brief thoughts before we go into a review in a few days time on it are that this one is fantastic in the game. Even completely untuned as all of the ones that I'm driving here are, it's already fantastic. It feels pretty much exactly what I said it would feel like, which is a combination of a BMW M2, in terms of being this compact little ball of power, but combined with the kind of charisma and svelte kind of uh, almost sexual approach to a, a performance car that a Maserati would have, and of course Alfa Romeo is known for that, blending those two together is what the Giulia should feel like, and I think they've done a pretty damn good job of that, again, at least compared to the GTA, which I drove. I will say it feels just a tad heavier through corners than the one that I drove in real life, because as I said, you know, phenomenal handling in real life, felt like a touring car for the road. This one doesn't quite feel that good, you can feel its weight, it feels almost just a touch too top heavy, but overall still fantastic, very forgiving, very quick, around 180 miles an hour even without any tuning, and you can have some pretty nice body mods for it as well. You can change the wing, the chin splitter, you cannot do the wide body though, for those who are interested. It kind of already has one though, so it's not too bad. And of course, a very significant new Alfa Romeo to add in general. Last, and well, probably for many people least, to be honest, the Ferrari. I was really hopeful for this one, because I was hoping that Ferrari might have some kind of input on making sure that this car is good because apparently Lamborghini didn't do anything like that based on how awful the Vision GT of theirs feels. This, I'm glad to say, is a whole different ballgame. Even if you don't like Vision GTs, if you get the chance to win the car, as many of us will, or even just drop a spare million on it when it arrives in the game, I would recommend doing it, because it's classified as a road car, with one hell of a lot of potential, over 900 points, over 1300 horses, 1250 kilos, all-wheel drive with a hybrid system. It looks pretty damn nice when you're actually driving it, the weirdly shaped back end notwithstanding, and it is, simply put, a pleasure to drive. Eight-speed gearbox, I believe it is, over 200 miles an hour even at Monza, 
And yeah, it, it's an absolute beast. You can limit the power, you can add ballast, you can change the tires, so there's a little bit of tunability. And because you can use it in road going events, well, at least if the point level is unrestricted, you could wipe the floor with any road going career mode event which you've been having trouble with unless you own a Tomahawk already, because, yeah, this thing is absolutely bonkers. It's easily one of the best Vision GT cars we have ever had, not just in this game, but in any game since GT6. It's literally that good. You don't need to do anything to it, and it's already fantastic, which is great. That's exactly what I'd hope for from a Ferrari. Overall, if there are any additional details, changes, maybe problems or glitches that you've noticed from this update, which there always tend to be here and there, then drop them down below. As you'll have seen probably from some of the scrolling text, they have addressed some of the issues, the clutch for example with the BMW M2, but anything else which you have noticed or think I missed out, absolutely drop it down below, and overall I'd say this is a pretty damn nice update. Of course we could always say about a new circuit, but at the very least we did recently get Road Atlanta, which is still a hell of a lot of fun. And yeah, overall, I'd say this is a good update. So drop your thoughts overall down below, and again, for those who would like the chance to win that brand new PS5, and who knows, depending on where you live, you might even meet me in person if I have to bring it to you instead of trusting these absolutely useless shipping companies these days. So if you do want to enter, it's the price of a cup of coffee, £2, and you can enter down below in the description. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.